Although the similarity between our languages and cultures proves that we are cognate, most of us don't know the Karai Turks, whose population has decreased up to 2,000 by now. And very few people know that they are the inheritors of Khazar Empire, one of the most important states in history. Recently, a short film about them has been shown on a documentary channel. Most of the viewers realize that they could understand the Karaim language listening carefully. I am a Karai Turk. We have come to Trakai, Lithuania, 600 years ago. My mother is making our national food. Kıbın is made of lamb and dough. In this film, it is stated that the Karaim language is regarded as one of the languages that should be protected by the United Nations. Many people wondered about the identity of the Karaims and their relation to Turks, but they couldn't satisfy their curiosity. In this documentary, aiming to find answers to these questions, we will explore the culture, the tradition and the language of the Karaims who have been scattered all around the world. And while watching all these, we will feel the warm-heartedness and sincerity, the invariable rules of being Turk for centuries. But this strong bond that brings us closer to these communities is wearing thin gradually due to the destructive force of the passing years. Where does the Turkishness of Karayims come from? We can answer this question like this. According to both the pieces written by Karayims in the past and the writings of the researchers, we can date the roots of the Karayims back to the Khazar Empire in the ancient history. In the 4th century AD, the Huns have come to the west from Asia, passing over the Ural Mountains and established a great empire in the middle of Europe under the leadership of legendary Attila. After Attila's death in mid-5th century, the Han Empire came apart. In place of it, between Ural Mountains and Europe, various Turkic states came into the picture. In the 6th century, in the region of today's Caspian Sea, north of Black Sea and Caucasia, a great state, the Khazar Empire, was founded. In 740, the Han of the Khazar Turks, Buyan, proclaimed Judaism as the official religion of the state. But while Han's family and the noblemen were adopting Judaism, the majority of the people were maintaining their lives according to various religions, such as Christianity, Islam, Judaism and the traditional ancient Turkic religion Tangri Shamanism. All these beliefs have been effective on the public for long centuries. After the dissolution of the Khazar state at the beginning of 11th century, when the majority of the Khazars who have adopted Judaism, faith, state and Crimea, a part of them migrated towards Inner Europe. Today, there are about 2,000 Turkic descendant Karayims scattered around different countries in the world. These 2,000 Karay Turks live predominantly in Crimea, Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania, in various regions of Russia, and with a limited number in European countries, in the United States of America, and even in Australia. Nowadays, most of the Karai Turks cannot speak their mother tongue due to various reasons. But they know very well that their grandparents have spoken Turkic in the past and that they belong to the Khazar Turkic culture. My parents, for example, both of them were speaking in Karaim. Both of my parents are speaking Karaim, but they didn't teach us. I attended to a summer school in Lithuania teaching Karaim, and now I want to carry on learning this language in Poland too. We try to keep our culture, our traditions and customs alive. We try to teach the children our culture, our food and our religious days. We tell them the importance of keeping our traditions alive.
We demonstrate the national karai costumes by means of the dance group of children learning folk dances and songs. We sew dresses appropriate to the original ones for them. We pattern the ancient costumes keeping their original styles. Unfortunately, the language is the weakest side of our society. I can say that my generation doesn't speak Karaim. We can understand and read, but cannot speak it. The most chosen expertise area for our people is Turkology. Our favorite profession is becoming a Turkolog. You have many famous Turkologs. What is the source of this interest? I think towards the end of 19th century, religious identities were remained in the background and a particular importance was paid to the ethnical identities. So they came into prominence. As a result, a closer attention was given to Turks and the Turkishness. Last year, our children joined to a camp coordinated for Turkic people in Crimea. Tatars and Gagosians attended too. The children were very delighted being there because they had common grounds. Here in Poland, we have a cohesion with the Tatars, but besides this, we live apart from our Turkic roots amongst the Slavic races. I speak a little Karaim, because only my mother could speak it, but now I am highly interested in my language. Do you teach Karaim language to your children? We try to teach them, but it's not easy. And since we don't know it ourselves, it's not right to expect it from them. In our cultural association, Karaim language courses are taught. Our children attend to these courses too. The first layer of today's Karaim's evolution has been created by Khazar Turks. But in subsequent centuries, living together with Pesheneks, Kumans and other Kipchak Turkic tribes had an important impact upon the culture of Karaims. We are Lithuanian Karaims. Lithuanian Karaims have come from Crimea in good health. Our ancestors are the Hazars and the Kipchaks. We speak in Karaim language. It's a Turkic language. The writing and speaking language called Karaim is a Turkic language code that is affiliated to the main Kipchak dialect of general Turkic language. Karaim is divided into three local dialects in itself. First one is Crimean Karaim dialect that is spoken in Crimea and the other places in Ukraine. Very nice. I speak to them in the marketplace. Tatars are astonished. They say, you speak Tatar language very well. The second is Halic Lutsk Karaim, spoken in Poland. I'm a tiny mosquito. I fly throughout the day. If I hear a gossip, I swallow it right away. And the third is Trakai Karaim, spoken in Lithuania. Ashkenazis gave us documents on which it was written that we weren't descendants of Israelites. We are Turks and our language is Turkic language. Karaim language differentiated during the centuries, borrowing lots of words from the other languages of the nations it lived together with. Its sentence structure deformed by the influence of Hebrew, which is a worshipping language, Latin, which is a literal language, and Cyrillic alphabet. General Judaism is based on both the Old Testament and predominantly on Talmud, which is the oral tradition of Judaism. But the Karaim sect doesn't accept Talmud, and it is deeply loyal to the Torah only. The Karaims accept only the Torah. 
I mean, we definitely don't accept the holy books added by the Jews, like Mishma, Dimara, and others. And also there is another difference. We regard Jesus and Muhammad as prophets. The word karai comes from the word kara in Hebrew, which means to read. Karai means the one who reads the holy text, and karaim is the plural form of it. The religious community named as karai and karaims consists of 50,000 people in the world today. But the majority of this community cannot be defined as Turks. Only about 2,000 out of these 50,000 Karais are conscious of that their ancestors were Turks and they spoke in Karaim language. Even though the Karaims have lived together with Jews for centuries, they haven't made intermarriages between them, and so they have managed to hide their cultural features and religious beliefs. Ashkenazis and Karai don't marry. A Karai man marry only a Karai woman. If a Karai girl marries an Ashkenazi, two religions intermingle. Kırım Karayları Crimean Karaims. Since they are of Crimean origin, they regard Crimea as their motherland. After the dissolution of the Khazar Turks in the 11th century, Karaims have continued their existence as a small princedom centered in a place called Kırkyer Kalesi or Trufutkale near Bahçesaray. <laughs> During the Crimean Khanate era, they have been attached to the Khan, but have preserved their local government. In the 19th century, during the Russian Empire period, Karaims were the citizenships sharing equal rights. They were ruled by their religious and secular leaders independently in internal affairs. But during the Soviet Union era, the administrative and religious structure of Karaims were destructed by communist Russian government. As a result of repressions and the forced migrations, the population of Crimean Karaims decreased up to one-tenth. Crimean Karaims started to be organized again only after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1980s. My name is Davut, El Davut. I would like to speak Turkic fluently, but I can speak only a little. The reason of this is obvious. During the 70 years of Soviet rule, to speak Turkic was forbidden. Our parents spoke Karaim. I remember what I have learned during my childhood. For example, as the Tatars spoke, some words sounded similar to me. I wish I could buy a house and cover its roof with tiles. I would take a wife if I could borrow money. One can't marry in debt, money should be paid. As you can notice, I tried to speak Karai. I hope you understood me as I understood your Turkish. What do you think about the future of Karaims. This is an important problem. The protection of the nation's purity is brought to the forefront rather than the renewal of the nation. As you know, under the previous totalitarian regime, Turks have been repressed and Ukrainians and Karaims intermingled. So the purity of our nation dies away. Crimean Karaims Association, founded in 1989, offers service to the Karaim communities in Akmescit, Gözleve, Kefe and similar regions of Crimea. Aiming to protect and develop the identity, tradition, culture and religion of Karaims, this association has some publishings too.
If I ever forget you, Jerusalem, and to hold you in my right arm, let me become speechless if I don't miss you, if I don't treasure you the most. To regenerate and to protect the language is important. Today, since only old people can speak this language literally, there aren't any young and competent educators who can teach it. So we cannot open language schools. But in 2002, with the support of TIKA, Turkish International Cooperation and Development Agency, prayer handbooks in Russian and Karaim were published. This is Balta Timas Cemetery which is the oldest Turkic cemetery in Europe. Balta Timaz means first growth forest in Turkish. As you can see, there are beech trees in the cemetery and we pray to those trees. Each lineage has a holy beech tree. Our lineage has one too. We go there and pray to it, but without showing off. Since these are the holy trees, it's forbidden even to break their branches. Circles drawn at the bottom of the trees represent the sun. There is nothing older than this, and the thoughts of all our people focus on here. This is our sanctuary. Visitors come here every day. The young people from Ethnic Cultural Center, called Kale, often came and cleaned this cemetery. The writings are in old biblical language, which is the language of God. The engravings on the gravestones have been written in solar style, and they belong to all Turkic nations. Famous traveler Evliya Celebi has written a lot about this cemetery. The long journey of the Turks starting from Central Asia towards the West has continued for centuries, and this migration has expanded up to Lithuania in the 14th century. The Grand Duke of Lithuania, by Staustas during his military expedition to the Golden Hordel between 1397 and 1398, has brought around 500 Crimean Karais and their families and around 3 to 4,000 Tatars to Lithuania and made them palace guards. There are two small Turkic colonies in Lithuania, Karai Turks and Tatar Turks. Getting along well with Lithuanian people, they have preserved their national identity throughout history. The Karais have settled to Trakai, and they have been engaged in farming and other jobs besides being palace guards. This small Karaim colony could preserve their own faith and their language, which was a dialect of Kipchak Turkic only up till the beginning of the 20th century. Under the Soviet rule, they couldn't fulfill their religious duties, they were dispossessed of their lands and a press group had to disperse. So the absorption of the culture and the language by younger generations was interrupted for 40 years. They speak Karaim language, but not very well. The youngsters don't speak, but they understand us when they grow up. They understand Karaim, but cannot speak it. They speak Lithuanian, Slavic language and Polish. They understand, but little children couldn't learn it, because it wasn't possible to learn it in Bolshevik era. 
They couldn't go to their chapel, Kineza, to perform their religious duties either. Out of about 1,500 Karims who have come centuries ago, only 250 have been left today. Trekai city doesn't offer employment opportunities. Most of the Karims went to Vilnius. They dispersed around various places in Poland. There are only 250 of us left now in all Lithuania. A few hundreds of Karaims live in Poland. To prepare kubun, first we put flour in a bowl and then add eggs, butter, salt, milk, clotted cream of milk. We mix all of them and after kneading dough, we wait for it to be fermented. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, we prepare the stuffing. We carve the meat, mm -hmm. add onion, black pepper, salt, water, and some green vegetables. Then we blend them all. We take small pieces of dough and roll out them. After putting the stuffing on them, we close the dough in the form of a crescent. We make two holes on each of them, and then we put them into the oven to be baked. The Karaims, who've come from Crimea to defend the Lithuanian castle, have been living in Trakai for about 600 years. Being one of the national minorities of Lithuania, this colony shows a great effort to revive, to maintain and protect its culture and language. A small part of Karaims live in Poland, especially in Warsaw today. They don't have a house for prayer, but a great cemetery in Warsaw. Since 30 years, I have been the leader of religious community of Karaims, which have been continuing its existence for about 600 years in Poland and Lithuania. After the Second World War, some of them moved to Poland, especially from Halic and Lutsk, according to the repatriation agreement. Currently, there are 150 Karaims in Poland. We live in different cities of Poland. Today in Warsaw there are more than 10 people whose parents are Karaims, but in fact we are a larger group because of the intermarriages. Most of the people engage their spouses to work for Karaim society too. And the children join in our daily activities and have a line on their culture. We try to demonstrate our mother tongue, its roots and harmony. We read poems, we publish poems and short stories in Karaim language, and more than enough for our small community. We publish a magazine named as Avazımız, Our Voice. 
We witnessed that between 1920 and 1940, publishing business has grown, especially amongst the Karaims living in Lithuania and Poland. During this period, the number of poets and scientists has increased, and a wide range of books and magazines have been published. Following the Second World War, during the Soviet era and after then, there has been a revival in the publishing activities of Karaims. The folk culture and literature of Karaims share similarities with the ones of other Turkic communities. They have their divan in folk literatures and mythology too. A folk song, Suffering Bright, is sung in the wedding ceremonies. Prominent author of contemporary Karaim literature, Alexander Markovits, revived Karai Turkic. He won fame with his poems, Yanhe Yirlar, meaning new folk songs, and Tozdurhan Birtik, meaning scattered wheat. The grammar and self-learning book published in 1996 by Lithuanian Karaims named as Men Karaiče Urene, meaning I'm learning Karaim language, has great importance. Our Turkic brothers and relatives came to us. We are very glad about this visit. My wish is this, don't forget us. Karim's predominantly live in Crimea and Lithuania, but some of them are in Istanbul. Their past in Istanbul dates back to ancient times. During the Byzantine Empire era, the Karaims in Istanbul have been expelled many times because of Christian bigotry. Their coming back for settling here permanently has been possible only after the conquest of Istanbul by Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror. Sultan Mehmet have brought not only the Karaims, but also the Jews living in Bursa and other places to Istanbul. Here is Karaköy. Köy is a suffix in the names of many districts of Istanbul, such as Hasköy, Arnavutköy and Kadıköy. Kara means black in Turkish, but in the name Karaköy, it has a different meaning. It is related to Karay Turks. When we look back at the history, we see that after the conquest of Istanbul in 1453 by the Turks, Sultan Mehmet the Conqueror have brought the Karaims living in various regions of Ottoman Empire to Istanbul and have them settled here. And after that, this district has been named as Karayköy, the village of Karays, because the population of Karaims has been dense here, and in the time it has shortened and became Karaköy. Besides here, the Karaims have lived in districts such as Balıkpazarı, Tahtakale, Unkapanı, Balat, Edirnekapı and Hasköy. Today, in Istanbul, Karaims are almost non-existent. Their population, which has been 150 in 1979, has been dropped up to 100 in the 1990s, and nowadays only about 50 Karaims live in Istanbul. The most important reason of this diminishing in population is the increase in the marriages out of their religious community, meaning in the marriages with Jews, Christians and Muslims. Our community here consists of 55 to 60 people and most of them are very old. The reason is that we had to make intermarriages, but since sometimes women and sometimes men predominated in numbers, we couldn't find suitable spouses. Because of that, some people chose their spouses according to their religion and some according to their races. In my time, I also couldn't find anyone having the same religion as me. I preferred to marry a woman of a suitable race. So my wife is a Muslim and we don't have any problems about religion. 
Bizim aramızda dünden ötürü herhangi bir problemimiz yok. Peki şimdi Well, what do the young people do now? Şimdiki gençler maalesef Some of them marry according to their religion and some of them marry according to their race. Sometimes they fall in love in the university and marry a Muslim, a Jew or a Christian. Or sometimes they marry someone from other nations. So the situation is more complex now. How do you see the future of the Karaims here? I don't think that Karaims have a future, because it seems that we are the last generation. We are only 50 or 60 people. My wife is from Jewish community. My children are more related to the Jewish community, because I don't have any social activities and religious doctrine to offer them, since we don't have such a system. So it's most likely that we are the last generation. I think Istanbul Karaim community will be extinct in time unless there will be a miracle. But we believe in miracles too. No one can know what will happen in the future. When was the last marriage made between two Karaims? If I remember correctly, the last marriage was made 10 to 11 years ago. A man found a wife for himself in Crimea and brought her to Istanbul. The migration of Karaims to various European countries, America, Israel, and even to Australia, in between 1979 and 1992, is another reason of decreasing their population here. How are your relations with other Karaim communities? We correspond with them by letters, or they come here from time to time to visit us. Also, even though very rarely, some Karaims living here might have gone to Lithuania or other places. I am one of them. I didn't go to Lithuania, but I have been to Crimea to see our family home, the places where our relatives have been raised and lived, and to establish a dialogue with the people there in a way. But we can't have a very close and permanent relation or opportunity to see each other often. How old is the youngest of the Karaims in Istanbul? If you mean as a male whose parents are both Karaims, I am the youngest member. I am 45 years old. Turkic Jews, who fear of vanishing in history, preserve their temple with caution, even though their number is very few. It is said that the history of this temple dates a very long way back, even back to the Byzantine period. This temple has burnt in a fire in 1729 and had to be rebuilt. But there has been another fire here in 1774. In 1800, it has been rebuilt and current form has been given to it. This is a building made of timber. In the ground floor, there is a chapel for men to pray. And in upstairs, there is a chapel for women. And this part is where the hazan, or cantor, says prayers. We name here as Teva.
I remember coming here in our childhood on religious festival days with our father. There has been a more crowded community then. The temple has been packed with people and sometimes some of them have been left outside since they couldn't have entered in. But in time, the number of incoming people started to decrease. Karaims living around Hasköy moved to other districts of Istanbul. It is said that there have been around four or five hundred Karaims here at that time. Karaims respect three divine religions and they have some religious practices reflecting a high influence of Islam. They have more strict rules about cleaning compared to other Jews. Differently from them, they performed ablution. Before entering their chapel, Kinesa and reading Tana, they wash their hands and feet as it's done in Islam. When they enter Kinesa, they take off their shoes as the Muslim do before entering the mosque, and even out of Kinesa, they never read the Torah with their shoes on. Karaims worship in Kinesa by prostrating themselves. The direction of Karaim chapels is southeast. It means that the Qibla of Kinesa is in southeast direction and there is an altar here. The burial direction in these cemeteries is north to south. During the sermon, the name of the Caliph is mentioned and prayers are said for the holy places, Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. Unlike other Jews, Karaims believe not only in the Prophet Moses, but also the Prophet Jesus and the Prophet Mohammed, who have come after him. Ashkenazis gave us documents on which it was written that we weren't descendants of Israelites. We are Turks, and our language is Turkic language. We pray to the Tengri too. We recognize Tengri's words. By contrast with the general Judaism, there isn't a clergy in Karaim religion. The religious ceremonies in Karaim chapels, Kinesas, are led by specially trained Hazans. They perform religious duties voluntarily. They earn their living by doing other jobs. Main duties of Hazans are leading the religious ceremonies, worshipping, saying prayers and performing marriage ceremonies. Karim say we are all the leaders and workers at the same time. So they don't have a leadership mechanism. Torah of Karaims is different from the one of other Jews. They recite the confession of faith of Judaism, listen and hear Israel, as listen and hear Karaims. They also differ from other Jews in some religious festivals and calendar. To spread or accept this religion subsequently is impossible in principle. One can be a Karaim only by birth. Karai Turks who have faith in Karaism name the Lord of the Worlds as Tengri in a similar way of the ancient Turks and rarely do they use the name Allah. I became happy with the words of Tengri. I am a slave on this earth. The tradition of circumcision in Karaim is more strict than the one in Judaism. The boy should be circumcised in eight days after he is born, and he is worn the Sabbath costumes. A boy should be named after he is born. And this should be done in here, in Kineza. His father tells me the name chosen, and this name is given to him here. At their home, a feast is through to celebrate it. 
When a girl is born, she is given a name too, but without throwing a feast. This celebration is made only when a boy is born. They sing as, a boy is born, how proud we are. Karaim youngsters reaching the age of marriage are given an advice that they should marry a Karaim by their families, relatives and the religious community. Although this tradition is still strictly obeyed by Lithuanian Karaims, it's been weakened among the Crimean Karaims and it's been left a long time ago by Istanbul Karaims. In the past, the ones who have married out of their sect have been excluded of the Karaim community. We don't have close relations with the ones in Israel, meaning with the ones who belong to the Karaim religion but are in Turkic. Since you are Turkic? Yes, since we are Turkic. And you don't make intermarriages with them? No, by no means. According to the ancient Karai tradition, in the wedding ceremonies, Hazan addresses the community like this. May happiness grow between you. We celebrate you. May you live long and be successful. May your descendants spread amongst us. Amen. Wedding ceremonies are very rare. How are they done? Everybody gathers together at the house. A written document named as Bitik is prepared. In this document, it is written what will be given by the bride, what will she do, what will the groom give to the bride, how he will take care of her, and provide for her. Then, they dress up the bride in one house and the groom in another house. They wear new and beautiful clothes. Afterwards, they come to Kineza. In Kineza, I, as a religious leader, read the document called Bitik. I will buy this and that to this woman, I will give her this and that, I will take care of her, it says. One of the songs sung in the Karaim weddings. You make me happy like a piece of pomegranate. Musk and cinnamon smells are coming from your house. It seems as grand as a palace due to your standing. My heart is latched onto your gentle heart. The beauty of your eyes attached to my heart. She is the whiteness of the moon, the rays of the sun. Her love is great everywhere. Will you give her to me if I increase the dowry? Yes, my heart is entrusted to your heart truly. The beauty of your eyes attached to my heart. Some of their wedding traditions show similarities to some of ours. For example, we all know the tradition of the bride hammam before the wedding. Karaims also take the bride's relatives to the hammam. And in the wedding feast, some meals familiar to us are served, such as stuffed vegetables, meat dishes, pastries, rice pilaf and compote. A jug is broken for bringing good luck. They hit the shoulders and back of the groom and he runs away. Then he goes to the bride's house to take her. He gives some money, some vodka and some sugar and buy the girl. Of course, after some bargaining, dialogues and laughter. Following that, everybody, the groom, the bride, the witnesses and Ataman, who is the person leading the wedding, go to the Kinesa, the temple, together. The religious marriage ceremony is performed there. To eat halwa after the deaths has become a tradition for Karaims too. And to perform mevlid ceremony seven days after the death is very common amongst Karaims. We have such traditions about death. There must be black halwa on the table after somebody is dead. It is being made on first, 
seventh and fourteenth day of death. After one year, feast or white halva is made. This shows that the soul of that person is in heaven now. So we celebrate the first anniversary as a festival. Black halva should be bitter, representing that we all suffer. But after one year, we celebrate the souls going to the heaven. Until the death, all the traditions comply with the laws and the religion. When one is dead, he is buried and Hazan prays for him. Also, men and women sitting in separate rooms commemorate the dead person and more. On the dining table, black halva, grapes and desserts are served. When it is said Karayim culture, Firstly, the language comes to the mind. Today, there are 2,000 Karayims living in Crimea, Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania, and in other places, but only 50 of them can speak their mother tongue very well. So Karayim language cannot be defined as a spoken language anymore. Uppsala University in Sweden organized the summer schools for four years under the professor of Turkology, Eva Ksato, to teach Karaim language. During these summer schools, Karaim colonies in various regions benefiting from the knowledge of the older generations are being informed about the language, religion and traditions. I go home in six hours. I have to rest. In Trakai, we organize a summer school for the Karayims living there for teaching them the Turk culture. Swedish institutes support us financially for this purpose, and with my friends, I give lectures here for two weeks. We teach Karayim language. This language is spoken only by approximately 30 people now. They are around 80 years old and their knowledge is about to vanish. So I want to try and help them with my friends. We went to Crimea together by plane. And we organized a summer school like this with Crimean Tatars there. It is very enjoyable study for Karayims. They can speak with Crimean Tatars because they can understand each other's languages. So, for example, in the marketplace, they can have a chat with the Tatars. We came to Trakai to learn our native tongue, to be able to communicate with people and to speak it within our family. A real Karayim should speak his language, and this language should be taught to the next generations too. I came here to learn to speak Karaim and to communicate with other people. It's a very rich and interesting language. Good morning. Have a nice day. How are you? Good morning to you too. Who is your mother? Nina. Who is your father? Roni. I speak Karaim since my childhood. As soon as I began to walk, I also began to speak it. Why do you teach Karayim? This is a difficult question. Unfortunately, we will die one day. And our number will decrease more and more and more in time. I can say that to know and hear one's native tongue is very important. They asked me to teach it, and I said, all right, I will try and help you as much as I can.
There are around 6,000 languages in the world today. According to the linguists, two to 3,000 out of these 6,000 languages will be vanished by the year 2020. I wonder how long will the Karaim language and culture be able to survive? We wish that Karaim language and culture will never die away. One day, I woke up very early and watched how they were catching fish. Two fishermen were catching fish in the lake. Well, how about you? My wife is ill. I came here today to open the Kinesa. We have visitors. Karai Turks are on the verge of extinction today. The strictness of the marriage rules of the Karaim sect and banning of the marriage between the close relatives caused their population to decrease gradually. When the number of the group drops down below a certain level, it becomes harder to find a suitable spouse. And there is a pressure put by the society. They say that a Karayim should marry another Karayim. But to find a suitable spouse to marry is very difficult. What do you think about the future of Karayims? Our ancestors, having lived in Crimea, Ukraine, left a great legacy to us. By preserving the cultural assets, the buildings and the statues, our nation will go on living for long years. So, maximum effort should be shown to prevent our relative nation Karaims from vanishing. Courses must be organized to teach Karaim language and culture. Karaim youngsters living in different countries should be brought together. Otherwise, this language will fade away amongst the ones who claim that Karaim isn't a Turkic language or was only affected by Turkish, and Karaims will lose their identity. Great efforts are made to protect the purity of the nation. In Ukrainian cities, national culture centers are being established. But unfortunately, Ukrainian government doesn't support us. The religious buildings aren't restored, and so our spiritual development brings to a halt. And it obstructs our cultural improvement. Our plan for the future is to try and preserve what we have. We try to raise our children by teaching them their culture culture and language. We would like to get in touch with other Turkic nations or organizations which are effective in cultural areas because such connections are creative and helpful for both sides. We don't have such contacts, but we are open to it. I want to send my greetings to all people watching this program in Turkey and invite them to know our people and culture. We are very glad for this connection with them. Since at least 100 years, they raise hell saying that the Karaims are about to disappear. But as you can see, they didn't disappear yet. We will see what happens next. To remind the world that we were the children of the same ancestors in the past can be possible only by knowing our historical brothers better and strengthening the bond between us. Turkic communities have spread on the globe like a spider's web. Turks have lived together with different cultures in harmony and without losing their own identities in every geography, in every region. This should be an example to all mankind, and the communities who speak various dialects of Turkic should be everlasting.